Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Resuming debate. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome back to Resuming Debate from our summer hiatus. It's great to be with you again. Uh, and uh, we've got a, a busy year ahead. We've, we've had a busy few weeks already in Parliament. There's lots going on, lots of exciting up to the minute things to talk about. Um, it, this is a forum for me to have longer form, substantive conversations with people about the issues of the day, as well as uh, to have interesting conversations about other things that are related to, but not directly on the subject of politics, things like history uh, and, uh, and important books I've been reading. So uh, today we're going to have a conversation about a topic near and dear to my heart. That is the question of, of how we approach childcare in this country. Uh, my wife and I had our sixth child uh, in August. So um, conversations about childcare are, are always uh, much more imminent than some of the other issues uh, that we deal with in Parliament. Uh, and I'm very pleased for this discussion about childcare to have uh, two uh, experts, uh, but experts with different kinds of, uh, of relationships to this topic and different kinds of experience. Uh, so I'm, I'm joined today by Peter John Mitchell. He's the current director of the family program for the Ottawa-based nonpartisan uh, policy think tank, CARDIS. Uh, CARDIS does great work uh, in Ottawa. Uh, they're located very close to Parliament Hill, and, and uh, they're always putting out interesting ideas and engaging parliamentarians on them. Uh, and he's also been a witness in the House of Commons at various, various committees over the years. I'm also joined by Crystal Churcher. Uh, she is a, an entrepreneur. Uh, she started Early Start Learning Center in Fort McMurray in 2014, and she's also the board chair of the Association of Alberta child care entrepreneurs. So uh, she, is, uh, she is, is both involved in the um, policy discussions of this and she's on the front lines of child care delivery. So uh, welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining me for this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, so I think a good place to start is there, there'll be some folks listening to this who are familiar with how the child care program now operates and, and what has changed under it. There'll be, there'll be others who have been following this debate but are less familiar. Uh, so maybe, Crystal, if you can start off from the perspective of, of uh, someone providing child care, what is the current federal program and what have been the changes uh, that you've seen over the few years in which this has been uh, rolled out? Sure. Um... Well, I mean, it's going to, to vary province to province, but essentially uh, the Seawell, the $10 a day program is, is taking over and transforming childcare from a mixed market childcare to more of a public sector, um, publicly funded program nationally. What we've seen is that um, each of our provinces have signed into a bilateral agreement. They negotiated terms with the federal government um, in Alberta right now, we're at about $15 a day for an average, but um, provinces will have to get to $10 a day by 2026, um, as well as create a certain threshold of, of new childcare spaces, mostly in a nonprofit model childcare um, to meet the guidelines of this program. Um, really, the intentions of it were to provide affordable childcare, which um, in Alberta, we reduced our fees by 50% as soon as we signed into this program and um, you know, provide accessible child care for families and inclusive child care. So I think you know, from a child care operator standpoint, we have gone from um, a private business uh, that had full autonomy over our operation and our fees and services to something that has been blended into more of a government-funded, uh, government-controlled sector. Okay. And, and just to drill into that a bit, you described the previous model as kind of a, a mixed model. So a model in which right. um, I, I would gather from that, that you have the freedom to set higher fees uh, for, especially for those who can afford it, right. but uh, that there would be certain kinds of subsidy programs in place for, uh, for those who can't afford it on a, on a sort of means tested basis. Is that right? Sure. Yeah. I mean, we were a free market prior to this. So um, you know, I'm, I'm an Albertan, so I do believe in free market and um, that free market and competition really does drive quality and innovation here. Um, we had the control of our own businesses to set fees. We could set programs. We 
um, had access to low income subsidies for you know those families who really need affordable child care and to um, wage different wage programs in our different provinces. So in Alberta, we have a wage top up program. So those two programs existed that, like they did across Canada way before Seawelk. Um, and they've all been pro provincially run because childcare is a provincial jurisdiction. Uh, and now they're looped in. So that's like a really important factor of this program that I think a lot of people are unaware of. If you can't participate in a Seawelk uh, program, if you're maybe a for-profit operator or you're excluded from it or you've chosen to not participate, your staff lose access to their wage top-ups. Um, you no longer can provide that in your center and the low-income families lose access to the subsidies. So um, those are two, two totally different programs that used to be independent of this that are now kind of intertwined. Okay, th thank you. Uh, Peter, in terms of just the structure of the program overall, um, is there anything that you would add to or disagree with Crystal on? And then maybe if you can share how what she's seeing in Alberta relates to what you're observing in other parts of the country. Yeah, so I, I think, uh, as Crystal has shown, it is a provincial responsibility. So if you're a parent that has paid for childcare in a licensed uh, capacity over, I don't know, perhaps the last two decades or more, you probably have not been paying the, the actual cost of that care. It's subsidized by the province and the federal government has transferred funds. I think what's unique in 2021 um, is that the federal government increased uh, the amount of money it was sending to the provinces, but it also came with uh, some pretty uh, pretty tight strings. And as Crystal had has already said, um, really that was focused on the priorities of lowering the cost, increasing accessibility, and uh, increasing inclusivity. So seeing uh, more spaces and more access for uh, either children with special needs or communities that are underserved, and then uh, trying to increase quality. So it really has, uh, again, the federal government is a funder. They don't regulate or legislate care. That's what the provinces do. Um, so they are a funder, but they are um, providing that money uh, with certain expectations of what what it'll be used for. And as uh, Crystal has said, um, definitely there is um, a, a preference or a bias towards nonprofit uh, uh, public type of care. Um, and for folks in um, in some provinces uh, like Manitoba, where much of the care is provided, not all the care, but much of it's provided in the public sector or not profit sector, that looks a bit different than uh, in Alberta, where more of the care is provided by for-profit independent providers. And so uh, it's really a one-size-fits-all system uh, apply to diverse uh, ways of providing and doing child care uh, in the licensed system. And that's not to mention the fact that um, uh, the way that I look at child care is it's the care of the child, no matter who provides that care. So many parents uh, choose the licensed system. Perhaps they want to have somebody that comes into the home or use a relative, or perhaps they want to have one parent uh, take time off work to care for a child for, for a time. Uh, there's lots of many different ways that, that uh, families uh, take care of care. And that changes over the life course as well. My own experience was many different forms of child care, but only one of the forms that I used would be eligible under uh, this kind of current program. And uh, really it services maybe about a third of families with children under the age of six. So that's a lot of folks that don't benefit at all from this program. So I think that's important to remember as well, that um, it's a, it is not certainly universal by any chance. And I, um, we don't actually hear the word universal very much mm -hmm. anymore in, in terms of promoting this program because it really is not universal. Right. Okay. So there's there's so many uh, jumping off points uh, uh, there from for both of your comments. I, I do want to just affirm your comment there about, um, I think many parents, if you look back over what they've done with their children and they would have used a lot of different kinds of childcare, uh, even in their own life. It's not it's not just family to family, but it's also you know what what we did when my wife was finishing her residency, and then what we did when I was running for office, and what we did afterwards, it, it, and and what we did when we had fewer kids versus more kids, and and um, it's a constantly changing, uh, evolving reality uh, for, um, for for many families. So, uh, simply put, for the provider you've got this dynamic of more money and less freedom, right? And you're, I guess you're kind of weighing those things off. Crystal, is that right? Uh, and, and how would you kind of weigh the dynamic in terms of less flexibility? Yeah. I wouldn't say more money. Okay. 
no, there's no more money. Um, if my fees were just hypothetically $1,000 and the parents were funded funding $1,000 a, a month, when we signed into this in Alberta, our fees were frozen. So if you are a child care operator across Canada, when you sign this, your fees are frozen. Um, you can't increase to meet inflation or increase costs for utilities or any of the things. Um, and now instead of a parent funding that that spot, the government's funding it. The fees, the amount hasn't changed. It just depends on who right. who's so getting, not, so, you know, yeah, so not more from. money to you, but more money from the government to you and as yeah. associated with that, a requirement that you charge less to uh, the the family. I guess a, a logical question coming out of that is, wouldn't it make more sense for the government to uh, give that money to the families and then let them use that money to, uh, you know, look at the different child care options and, and pay whatever the fees that are that are there? Like if the goal is to subsidize the families in paying for child care, why not simply subsidize the families in paying for the child care? That's like a million dollar question right now. Um, we've been asking it for forever here uh, in our association. Uh, I think that, you know, my opinion, it always brings me back to what is the actual goal of this program, um, which I don't, I don't believe is to support families. Essentially, I think it's to create a public system in a mixed market space. Um, and I, I think that parents need to really look at this program on what it's actually costing them, um, who can access it, and what it's creating, because it isn't meeting its objectives or, or goals, in, in my opinion. Um, I don't know, Peter, John, if you want to jump in on that, too. Yeah, but... please. Yeah, so I think the the benefits of a, of a system that would say cash to parents would give parents the flexibility to choose the type of care that they want um, to use and to to leverage that, that funding to the best form that fits their family and, and their diverse ways of, of caring for kids as, as we have discussed. I think too, it would uh, lessen some of the administrative burden on people like Crystal who, um, this program has increased the amount of time, uh, energy um, that they have to put into, and costs quite frankly, um, yeah. that they have to put into uh, uh, reporting into filling a forms, applying for grants, that that sort of thing. Like this is a, it, it's a, there's an administrative cost both um, both for the government to to administer it, but also for providers. And one of the things about this type of program as well is that it does require the government to understand what it costs to run a daycare, which is tricky business. So in Nova Scotia, for example, uh, they're one of the earlier adopters to the program. Uh, uh, signed on, and uh, the intent of the, their agreement was to change their, their their sort of mixed market program into a fully public program under a central organization within the first eight months of the agreement. I can tell you, just looking at the face of it, it wasn't going to work, and it certainly didn't work. But one of the aspects of their agreement was that they were going to hire an outside consultant about four months into the uh, into the program to find out what it costs to run a daycare. And that consultant came back and said, there's too many variables. We can't figure out what it costs to run a daycare, let alone what it costs in this region, in this city, uh, for this provider over here. And it does create um, the scenario where the government has to understand or has to know um, what, what each individual uh, provider and each area scenario requires in terms of cost, because they are they are capping uh, they're capping fees, so they have to make up the difference. Um, uh, and in uh, and essentially the the central model that that Nova Scotia had signed on to um, basically has been abandoned because it just wasn't feasible to completely flip uh, flip their 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 system. And again, this is a one size fit all sort of scenario being uh, pressed onto a province, onto a device, uh, diverse uh, uh, sector, and uh, it just didn't work. Okay, so there's there's a struggle in a, in a fully public model with the government actually understanding how much it, it would cost to run a, 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 a daycare. Crystal, I, my understanding though is in the, in the present system, even, even uh, in, in the context of what they're doing in Alberta, there's some implicit requirement for them to come to some conclusions about what they think it costs to provide a childcare space, right? Because they're providing you a, a subsidy and limiting the fee you can charge. And some bureaucrat mm -hmm. somewhere has to make an evaluation of uh, whether that combination of what they're paying you and the fee is going to make it possible for you to sustain and grow your your business. Um, 
I know the answer because I've seen what, what you put out on this, but for, but, but for, our, for our audience, <laughs> how, how good a job are they doing of understanding uh, the costs associated with, with running a childcare business and, and putting you in a position to continue to operate and expand? Horrible. I mean, it's absolutely the most dysfunctional analysis of, of a business model you can imagine. I mean, you have a federal government who has never regulated childcare, has no jurisdiction over it, doesn't operate childcare or build it, um, putting forward a national program that they don't understand. Um, they're using advisors and research, in my opinion, that are completely biased to one side of a mixed market. Um, and again, don't have that understanding of what it's like to actually operate a viable child care center. Um, I was in a committee meeting yesterday uh, with stakeholders for, for the federal government and um, the, the look of shock on their face when I say that child care is twofold. Like you have your education side of child care, your early childhood component, the curriculum, the educators, that portion, which is wonderful. And we absolutely need to fund that. However, if you can't operate a viable business model to maintain that center, it's not going to stay open. And I feel like they don't understand there is a huge component of administration management um, business that goes into these child care centers, regardless of business model. A nonprofit still has to be able to pay their bills or they're not going to be open long term. Um, it, it's just ridiculous. I mean, Alberta has put out a questionnaire at the end of the summer to try and understand what it costs um, three years in. So you've been funding a program for three years and you're going to now ask us what it actually costs us to operate um, because they're looking at these buckets of funding in our new cost control framework, which is what's happening in Ontario right now with their cost control framework and what will be happening in each province because cost control framework is part of this agreement. Um, and there's just no understanding and there's actually no consideration for what it's going to cost and what the investment is going to be to have quality childcare, not poor, basic, you know, putting one child in a center with the lights on and, and some toys to play with, but quality childcare that we have now, um, it's severely underfunded. This program is not going to sustain the market and the type of childcare that parents expect. Hmm. The, the, the federal government entered into these agreements with the provinces and the provinces accepted these dollars, actually not knowing what it would cost to run the system or uh, to, to, you know, develop the system uh, in, the, in the way that uh, was being proposed. So at the very start of this program, uh, costs were unknown mm -hmm. <laughs> and agreements were entered without actually knowing what it, what it, what it costs to actually run this program. Yeah. So, so uh, I want to come back to the point you made about, quality crystal in a, in a minute because I think that that is a big a big part of the um, part of the debate um, but to, to these claims about universality the, the, the promise of a universal uh, child care program um, what has been the reality in terms of the impact of this policy on availability of child care is child care more available is it less available and then I guess following from that if, if the changes that have been made are putting more strictures on businesses that make it harder for them to expand, are we going to see a drop off at some future point in the availability of childcare? Uh, so maybe, uh, uh, Peter, do you want to start off with this one and then, uh, and then Crystal? Yeah. So anytime you subsidize something, you're going to drive up demand. And so you're going to have people leaving their current providers looking for who may be outside the system looking for, for less expensive care. So certainly it has, uh, it has created demand in that way. I think uh, talking to other providers around the country, we've seen, uh, for instance, um, uh, one provider was saying that typically in September, they see uh, children kind of leave and head into JK or junior kindergarten, those types of programs. And it's just not happening because parents are realizing, hey, it's cheaper to keep my child in full-time daycare than to send them to a school and have to pay for after school, before and after school programs. So this is sort of unintended incentives uh, that weren't seen that are also kind of hampering access. The reality too is it's one thing to lower the cost of something. It's a much different game to try to build spaces and create spaces. And so we have seen uh, that the provinces are missing their targets on this. And that uh, uh, this, the stated amount of spaces to be created will not 
that my target is not going to be met. It's just clearly not going to be met. So in, in Alberta, I think they've created 22,000 new spaces, but they're on tap to complete 68,000 spaces by the end of 2025, 2026. So they've basically got a year to go, right? They're not going to make the target. It's just not going to happen. So um, <clears throat> it is kind of creating uh, uh, these challenges. At the same time, as you said, uh, uh, Garnet, um, really the design of this program is to squeeze out uh, independent providers. Um, it's pretty clear. So uh, that comes in the form of not just not making cash available for space expansion and that sort of thing. So it's kind of a slow turning off the tap, slowly starving these uh, these businesses out. Um, and in some cases that, again, in Nova Scotia, it wasn't supposed to be so slow. It's supposed to turn this uh, sector on its head within eight months, which didn't work. So um, yeah, it, I, I, for me, practically speaking, I don't know how this system, how this system is envisioned to be built without independent providers, and especially in places like Alberta. I just don't understand uh, the thinking on that. It doesn't make sense to me to say that we're going to slowly uh, remove these providers and somehow meet all these targets. It, does, it doesn't make any sense. Okay. It, it's crazy. I mean, there's in Alberta, I mean, across the country, like I am co chair for the National Committee on Child Care Reform, um, and we've talked to operators across. The country and access is is an issue everywhere it doesn't matter where you go if it's a province like manitoba where it's substantially a nonprofit, or you're in alberta where where the majority stakeholder is for profit you still have the same issues um you can't roll out a program that creates an overnight demand without any infrastructure or workforce strategy behind it and expect it to be successful and i think one of the sad unfortunate uh, unintended consequences of, of this program is the people who need child care affordable child care the most are the ones that are sitting on the wait list right now without mm. access um, the people that could afford child care were already in these spaces when this program rolled out or they were at the beginning of the wait list the people who couldn't afford child care were the ones that rushed out to be added to these wait lists when this was announced and we can't create, we cannot rely on a nonprofit model of childcare um, across the country. I, I, there's so many issues with it, even just from an on the ground operator standpoint, you're running a nonprofit um, childcare center, you're totally reliant on a board to manage your center, a board of volunteers. So where do those people come from across the country to manage all of these new childcare centers? Um, it's not a sustainable model. And as somebody who's invested my own savings and time and, and everything to create private childcare in my community, why would I do that now? Like in order to get a commercial lease, I, I had to put my house on mm -hmm. the line and my family savings and, and everything. And why would I take that risk? And again, like something else just around investment. I mean, you have something that just drives me insane is when I hear this, uh, this program rolled out as, good feminist social policy. I mean, I can say that the majority of, um, of owner operators of private childcare are women like myself. We're moms, we're educators. Um, we created this to support our communities based on a need. And we have a federal government that is essentially stealing it from us, um, has devalued and, and taken away our investments um, and really def defamed us in this. Like private childcare is not represented well in this program um, or through the federal government's voice um, in, in advocating for this program. So I, I really feel like it's just such a such a shame that we're rolling through this program, all this investment, um, and it's not really going to meet the needs of families. It's not supporting women who are, are in this space already. And um, I, I have to ask myself, what's the intention here? Like, what are we actually doing? Yeah. Crystal, to follow up on that, it sounds like what you're describing is a bit of a, a ticking time bomb, right? You're you're already in the system. You have uh, you've built mm -hmm. up a childcare business, and I, I'm guessing people like you are gonna are gonna hang on for as long as possible because you you are invested in and you believe in what you're doing. But in the context of this system, you may have a lot fewer people that are gonna start down that road in the first place. They're just gonna opt to to uh, work in a space where they have a little bit more uh, more autonomy and flexibility, uh, and and also this this process makes expansion more difficult because if if the costs aren't lining up uh, and, and you don't have the ability to invest in um, 
in expanding your uh, your spaces, and you know that then then this program is is creating problems that will become greater as time goes along, as fewer people are 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 going into this or expanding, uh, and the squeeze is on the existing providers. Would you would you agree with that assessment in, in general terms? Um, I think there's kind of two parts to that. So I think like for myself, I, I was going to open another another center um, when this first rolled out, and I chose not to because it, the risk is just too huge. There's no point in putting a risk mm-hmm. um, into this for me right now. Um, but I think that what you're seeing is this is kind of an, another unintended consequence. Um, you're forcing people who would have privately invested in this space um, to go and open nonprofit centers. Like I, I call them pseudo nonprofit centers. These are your private investors, usually large corporate childcare centers who would have used their own money to create childcare spaces, but they can't access Seawalk. So they, they flip to a nonprofit model. They go and now they're getting grants. So now the public is actually funding the creation of these centers um, where private investment would have done it. So, I mean, in, in a public system where we're already taxed so much, why are we putting more taxpayer money into something that private investment is there and ready and willing to do? Um, so I don't really know if it's going to necessarily stop investment into the space. I think it'll be publicly funded investment and in this kind of like mixed private nonprofit model. Um, but I mean, what's to say, like I know for myself, when we get to our next phase of our agreement in Alberta with cost control framework in, in April, um, if it looks anything like Ontario, I, I'm not signing. Like I, if I know, knew now what I, if, if back then when I was presented with this agreement, I could see forward to what it actually was, I would never have signed my center into this. Um, and I think that is a lot of us feeling the same way across the country and across Alberta. And I think what you'll see is that operators who have a solid center, who offer really quality programs, niche programming, um, different things for their communities, and parents want this program, these programs, they've chosen it. That's why we have 67% in Alberta for-profit operators. Um, We're going to remove ourselves from this. And unfortunately, parents will be in a two-tiered system, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that's where we'll end up here is that... There's really no benefit. The two tiers being where if you're if you're for profit, you have to fully opt out of everything, uh, and yeah. fees, you know there's, that yeah. comes at a cost, yeah. right? You have to raise like if I left this program right now, I'm going to have to raise my fees not just to the level that's funded by the government, um, but more because I now have to pay my wage that wage enhancement to my staff in order to retain them because. I mean, we can't be undercutting our educators. That's the quality of childcare. Um, and then I'm going to, you know, have to increase so that I can operate outside of this program. But yeah, I think that's, that is going to be the future. You're going to have people leaving this because um, it, it, a lot of us don't want to lose the integrity of our mm-hmm. programs. We don't want to reduce quality to basic core regulated childcare in order to meet the needs of yeah. this. Uh, John, um, just a Think, thinking about this and sort of the economic uh, structural questions kind of underlining it. Um, sorry, I said John Peter. I mean, uh, the, the um, like, just to play devil's advocate, there, there, there are some people out there who probably don't, uh, don't see the problem with everything being run by not for profits, right? Who just say, well, well, why, why do I want to see uh, investors collecting profit on, on childcare or anything else? Why can't, why can't the whole world just be operated by uh, by not for profits? What, what what would you say to people who 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 have that kind of pre existing ideological frame to show them that there are actually um, practical consequences in terms of what's available if everything is pushed in the direction of of uh, not for profits? Yeah. So one thing that we've seen so far is. Um, uh, that uh, independent licensed providers tend to establish new centers more quickly um, and more efficiently. It's just they can do it faster and more efficiently. So I mean, if you're in favor of this program, then it would make sense to have people that can efficiently uh, get that, get those spaces um, to market, that make it available. Um, I, I think one of the challenges that we're seeing, and this kind of speaks to what Crystal was just um, talking about, but um, in Ontario, uh, we're now moving towards kind of a model 
where if you want to get any funding as a provider, including streams of funding you received from the provinces previously, um, you need to join the program. So it's either all in the program or it's all out of the program. Um, and so I think that's uh, that's a significant challenge because many providers are looking at the books and saying, I can't afford to, uh, to kind of carry on. Um, I, I think the other part in terms of affordability and economics um, is that a lot of the money is never getting to parents. It is going into bureaucracy. It's going into other things um, that never really affect parents and never really lower other costs or give them quality care or whatnot. Um, seven of the provinces have amended their agreements to increase the portion of unspent funds from their agreements uh, as carryover from year to year. So all the agreements have some sort of provision of a certain percentage of unspent money that can be carried over. We've seen seven provinces uh, amend their agreements to increase that sometimes from 40 to 70% or more of unspent funds. And in three cases, we've seen provinces have two amendments to the agreement because it's happened more than once. So it's not just a matter of money in the system. It's the inability of provinces to actually action the money that they do have and to do so efficiently. And in other provinces, we've seen sort of cancel initiatives and then bundle things into grants because it's easier to get a grant out of the door. So um, it's not an efficient system. Uh, it, it's it's not working well and targets are getting missed. So, I mean, if you want to move to a fully public system, okay, but um, to think that this is going to accomplish what sort of the vision that's been laid out, it's, it's just, it's currently not happening. We're not getting there. And even in Quebec, where we have had this program for more than two decades, we still have private providers and not been able to get, um, get out of that, that, that sort of model. In fact, in the early days, they did sort of choke out or, star, or, or starve out uh, independent providers and had to bring them back because they just couldn't develop the system. Um, and so I, I think that's a um, I think that's a warning um, just about the system in general. Yeah, that's uh, that's really good. I, I think what people sometimes miss about for profit companies in general is that uh, the person making the profit is also bringing a lot of valuable things to the table, right? They're, uh, they're taking risk. Uh, they, you know, in many cases, you've got an owner operator, someone who is, who is running the business, who if, if they weren't the owner, then you'd, you'd have still have to pay them a salary. But to your point about startup speed, um, uh, when you have a, 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 a childcare business, somebody sees the opportunity and is going to is willing to put their money on the table to get it built and get it, it moving forward right away uh, versus a, a not-for-profit situation uh, where uh, that money has to has to come from someone who is who is not the individual investor um, in, in this model likely it would be it would be the government right Um if anyone wants wants to respond to that, and then I'll maybe ask about uh, the quality uh, the quality question. Um, I think like I'll just throw this out there. This is maybe a little bit more Alberta than than some of the other things we'll talk about. But I think you know I think something maybe Canadians need to think about when you're saying like, well, this is childcare; it should be public. Why should people be making profit off of children? Those mm -hmm. kind of kind of thoughts. Um, we were here before there was nothing that stopped private investment into child care my center um is a, is a really well recognized award-winning program in my community it's very high quality um why why is it okay to have my center essentially bumped out or you know bled out of this program just to create an ideological system and i i always have asked People like look at this, you know, if you had a piece of property and the government wanted to put a highway through it, would you expect them just to run it through your house and, and shame you for being in the way? Or should they buy you out at fair market price? Like that's kind of been my, my ask to the federal government. If you don't want private operators in this space, then come up with a solution and either buy us out at a fair value and respect the fact that we supported the child care industry and our communities for decades. Um, I, I just find it is such a it's such an insulting thing to be in the space and have what you're doing and everything turned against you and, and kind of tried to be taken from you just to push through a program. It's, it's been really, uh, that's what got me into this advocacy. I was yeah. so upset by the fact that that was happening. Yeah. So on the issue of quality, um, 
I, I, I'm curious for, for both of your thoughts on if quality in childcare is something that can be defined uh, in an objective way, or if uh, the goal of providing quality childcare is that it be responsive to the, um, uh, the, the, the values and ideals and expectations of the family who is, uh, who is seeking out because quality may be, it may, perceptions about quality may vary, but there may also be some objective markers. Um, I mean, we're heavily regulated, mm -hmm. uh, our sector heavily regulated, regardless of your for-profit, non-profit, you all follow the same regulations, which are supposed to determine quality. Um, you know, so I think if, if from a government level, if you're feeling that the quality in the sector is not there, then we need to revisit the regulations that set that standard. Um, I think though, that in a free market system, quality is, is part of, you know, competition will regulate quality. Mm -hmm. Parents will regulate quality. Um, it, I think what we're seeing right now is because there's no access or choice for families, they're forced to stay in city, in situations in childcare that they're not comfortable with, that they don't maybe feel is the best fit for their child or even a safe place for their child, but they have nowhere to go. Um, that's not quality. So I think that we're going to continue to go down that, that path if we don't fix the accessibility thing. Um, I also think too, like we're not funding this enough. So how long can we continue to maintain the standard that we're already at? It's going to slowly drop. And I mean, we're never going to get it back if we don't fund it properly. So I think it's, it's awful kind of all over the place. There's no regulation or standard for quality in Canada other than our childcare regulations, which we all follow. So, um, I mean, without competition in the market, you're really eliminating any other factors that are going to determine quality. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the challenges for this discussion uh, that you were alluding to, Ngara, is uh, we don't necessarily have agreed upon definitions or, or um, common usage of what we mean when we talk about quality. Um, and quite often, I think in public discourse, quality has come to mean how much money do we pay ECEs and uh, the availability of professional development. Now, that, that's certainly an aspect of quality, but it wouldn't be the only aspect of quality. So I think... Uh, when we're thinking more broadly about quality, we're, we're probably thinking about structural issues like ratios of children to staff member. It could include uh, training of staff, um, spaces that, that the size of space or the use of the facility, that, that sort of thing. But there's also process elements, which are how is that child attached to their caregiver? Um, what's what's the environment? What's the experience that they have with their with their caregivers? Right. So that's a little more. Uh, that's a little more of a tricky question. And I think what's challenging under this program is it's it's a real challenge to square, or it's a real challenge, I should say, to connect this idea of low cost to parents, high access, lots of access, and high quality. It's that's just a very difficult triangle to try to to try to tie together, in part because it's just so costly. And caring for vulnerable uh, populations is expensive, whether it's children, whether it's uh, elder care, whether it's uh, people with disabilities that need care. It's just very, very expensive, and you can't do it on the cheap. And yet, um, I, uh, um, I think it's just it's it's. I think it's, my concern is that quality is the first thing that's going to be sacrificed. And I say that because in the Quebec system, they have the, the largest ratios between how many children one particular caregiver can give. I know within the last couple of years, they've also played around a little bit with um, with qualifications and how many qualified staff have to be in in uh, in the child care uh, so that they could increase spaces so that they could and so they're willing to kind of shave a little bit on quality to try to bump up spaces and I think this is the tension that this program is going to face and my concern is that we are going to implement a mediocre or low quality system uh, within quite across Canada because uh, we're living in this tension that we can't we can't uh, um, we, we just can't afford the quality and the high access and the low fees. Yeah, so just, just one observation about your, your comment there about how quality is often defined. It would seem to me that things like uh, pay levels and ratios, these are factors that can uh, contribute to quality, but they're not quality in and of itself, right? You could, you, you could have people that are, uh, uh, happen to be really excellent at their job uh, and for whatever reason, aren't paying, aren't paid as much as someone down the street who's not as good at their job and being paid more. So qu quality, 
you know, these, these things may contribute to quality, but it, w- it would seem that quality is, is more a kind of intangible uh, that is, is in the experience of the child and the family uh, in, the, in the moment. Uh, and that is harder to quantify bureaucratically. I suppose you could through surveys, right? You could, you could rigorously survey uh, um, families and, and uh, keep kind of scores of their assessment of their experience, or you could, you could test certain skills before and afterwards. You could measure long-term outcomes. So there would be ways of, of measuring that, um, but it's not, it's not those, those immediately obvious factors. It would be a more kind of rigorous assessment that um you know that would... yeah it's typically i think we're, we're dealing with proxy measures to try to, to to come up with some way of measuring quality so um ece pay um the theory is that you pay an ece more though they're a lot much more likely to stay with that facility or stay with that operator and that's probably true but what i don't see in the studies or i don't fully understand is what is the appropriate pay level what's the precise point that ensures quality versus this amount right so in that way, it's a proxy. I know what we're trying to get at with that. I'm happy with ECEs being paid well, um, but I think the quality discussion is a little more. Uh, it's a little more thick than that. Uh, there was a huge uh, study done in the in the U.S. Uh, by the National Institute for Child Health and Human Development, fifty million dollar study that looked at uh, they looked at all kinds of things, looked at quality, looked at all that kind of thing, and they found uh, the top measure of quality was actually when they had parents or grandparents, like a, a grandparent caring for a child in the home, and in that case, they were spending the big bucks to send evaluators into the home to do interviews and to be in the home. So that would be the kind of level of quality measure that you'd, you'd actually have to send researchers into. To, daycare centers spending hours with kids and that to kind of measure the type of quality that I think you that you're that you're getting at Mm -hmm. Um, so this is a really uh, kind of tricky question so we kind of have to work with um, with with these proxy measures and again I think that's where in Quebec we saw like some of playing at the margins with 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 some of these uh, with some of these yeah but I I suppose the alternative is is just a kind of market-based quality measure right so uh, it's it's where um, Parents are supported to be able to have access and make choices, uh, but assuming that uh, that the mom and dad picking up their kids and saying, "How was your day? What did you learn?" Uh, provides a pretty robust uh, quality feedback mechanism uh, that isn't isn't available to the state except at a at a great uh, expense and and over a longer period of uh, period of time. Crystal, is this is this sort of one of the the arguments for that kind of market based quality evaluation? I mean, before this, if you you know, I'm a parent. I have two kids that were in childcare. Um, I can tell you that talking to other moms, walking into a center, experiencing it, feeling it, talking to the um, educators would give you a ton of information on whether it's a good fit for yourself or your family. Now, you, like I said, you have no choice. You have no access. You're going to take whatever you can get. And that's not a good place for parents to be in because now quality really isn't something that they get to even have the luxury of, of having because they just have to take whatever they can yes. get. If, if in the past my center was low quality and parents weren't choosing it, guess what? I'm going to be out of business in six months. Like, you know, you, you have to be innovative. You have to meet the needs of the community um, and you have to stay viable because your house is probably tied to your lease. So um, I think that that was a huge driver. And I think we've, we've really crippled that in this. Program. Yeah. And is there like, is there a distinction uh, in your experience between quality and fit as well that you, you might at a particular center say, Hey, this, um, there are certain things about this center that would be great for a different child, but, but aren't a great fit for, for, for my child. Absolutely. I mean, um, I have two children and both are hugely different personalities. And, you know, my daughter has always been wonderful in a school setting and a larger kind of social setting. My son is more of a day home individual one on one type of of child and um, parents know best, I think I think always back to the parents, it's your choice. I, I do think that something with this program too is, is the disparity in funding. So Um, what we're seeing, like my center is a preschool program. So we offer like a learning environment. It's part days more part-time program. It's not facility-based daycare in order for parents to really receive $10 a day. They have to be in a full-time facility-based daycare space. 
So what that means is that not only can you not access a spot, but you don't really have a choice to find a program that fits to your child. You're going to have to go to a facility-based daycare because that's where you can access this. Um, in my center as a preschool, parents are, are able to get $75 off a month for affordability grant. If they go to a full-time daycare, they can get $1,000 or more off. Um, so really there's not a lot, like it's really creating these kind of um, differences in funding that driving parents in order to get their funding to be able to afford childcare, they have to go to, to daycare. And like um, Peter John mentioned, that's impacting kindergarten. That's impacting, you know, um, out of school care. I had a conversation with a social worker in my community recently about um, the amount of, of calls and, and issues over the summer with parents who are leaving their children at home uh, because they can't afford summer camps. Um, daycares are full because they run year round and there was no like out of school care options uh, and just something that they had never experienced before. So I think there's a ton of unintended consequences of this program um, and it just, you know, the choice and, and where you can access it is just another one to add to it. In terms of that, I think the word, um, so let me, let me throw something else in the mix and then, and then I'll, um, yeah. I'll go back to both of you, but I, in terms of this, the flexibility piece of it, um, how is kind of coming out of COVID, the increase in work from home, uh, how is that changing the, the, the demand? Because if, if we could have spoken five or 10 years ago about, different families doing things different, different ways. I mean, I think the, um, that, that diversity has extended significantly. And so how, what changes are you seeing as a result of these, these new dynamics? Um, uh, I'm not, to be honest, I think that the funding has, has caused bigger changes than those okay. dynamics, because maybe if you're working from home, you would have chosen a part-time program to get your child socialized or ready for school or something. But now you really don't have that luxury because it costs you more to do that than it does to put them in a full-time daycare space. So what we are seeing is a lot of families are putting their children in daycare full-time um, when they don't need it because that's the only place to access these supports. Yeah. Peter, go ahead. Yeah, flexibility is actually where I was going to go. So we were, we were right on the same same page there. I think the word flexibility does get used quite a bit for this program, but by its by its design, it's inflexible. It actually isn't, it isn't flexible. So. Um, it, it is somewhat interesting that this program uh, sort of landed um, right at the time when we were seeing a, a big change in the way that we do work and the way that we do uh, work and, and family life. So I think that's interesting. I, I don't have a, like a, a real read on 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 that other than to say like I, I don't because it's inflexible. Um, I don't know that it really did respond to that to that environment or the ongoing environment of, of people working from home. I do know that. Um, uh, so, so I think I believe it was in Manitoba <clears throat> created some sort of funding for splitting uh, spaces to allow for more part time, and it was actually wildly popular. So that tells me there's probably some demand there. Yeah. But in most cases, this program really isn't really set up for that. And I think the other uh, challenge is for those who are working non-standard hours and this has always been an issue and i think it will continue to be an issue it's an issue in quebec where they have the model that the federal government uh, admires um and and uh for those that are working shift work or whatever it's just very difficult to find uh that type of care and particularly for lower income families who might be working um you know inconsistent hours or working uh, part-time hours working non-standard care hours, it's very difficult for them to find care. We know looking at Statistics Canada data that they're more likely to find that care actually outside of the licensed system. But again, they're not getting uh, help from this program uh, to cover those those costs. And there have been pilot projects, but it is, it's a pretty challenging for a centre to try to offer off-hour cares or overnight care or uh, weekend care. It's just uh, to make that a go, it's just, it is um, kind of a challenging, uh, it's kind of uh, challenging logistically. So, um, but uh, th those needs remain, and I don't think this program uh, really addresses those needs. Yeah. Okay, two two uh, questions I want to get in uh, before the end. The, the first is about kind of the political conversation around this, this issue. Uh, my, my impression is that part of who the government is trying to sell this program to are those who are not actually at present using it. It's people who used to have kids in, in childcare, uh, who, who, who hear the rhetoric about universal childcare and say, Hey, that would have been great. Or you have people that are, that are, uh, uh, planning to be parents in the future 
who are who are also thinking, man, it'll it'll be great if this program exists. Um, but but a lot of people that are that are in the system now are are experiencing frustrations. Uh, so it's it's important that people know about these problems in the in the system and that it's not measuring up at all to the to the rhetoric. But what what do you think the perception is among among parents among um, parents of older kids among among future parents uh, about the kinds of messages they're they're um, they're receiving and and how is this going to shape the the public conversation? That's an interesting question. I think the ten dollar day tagline is very easy to grasp, and so it was a big it was a big uh, big seller. And I was uh, speaking with actually an American journalist a while back, and they said, "What do you think Canadian parents don't know about ten dollar day care?" And I was like, "I I don't know where to start because there's so much of this program that um, is uh, so complex that uh, we don't understand." Um, because uh, the communication on us have been pretty simplistic. One of the things that we've uh, we've been doing at Cardis is looking at the implementation of the program. So we've been actually collecting public data or putting in freedom information requests to get uh, the data that corresponds with the action plans that provinces have put forward. And it's really looking through that data and measuring that, that we, we see just um, how short this program is coming up. Yes, it has lowered costs for families, particularly families that are already in licensed care, as, uh, as as Crystal said, but on so many other measures, on access, uh, on inclusion, uh, on equality, um, provinces are struggling to action this money and struggling to meet the targets that they've set out in their plans. And we're now in year four, we're almost at year, year, year five of this. So um, I think most parents would say, yes, uh, it's hard to find, it's, it's uh, expensive if it's not in the system, but I, I don't know that uh, families fully understand uh, the complexity of it, how much money is going into like bureaucracy or going into other things that they don't actually see, and maybe how inaccessible this program is. Um, it, it, there's sort of this understanding that, well, it's just getting started. We just need to give it more time. But when I look at Quebec, I see the same problems there with access, same problems there with, uh, with ECE pay and, and quality issues. Um, I, I think it's the design of the program, which is the problem. Um, and I don't think that uh, that's going to be overcome anytime soon. And so I think that's what I'd want parents to understand, uh, how they're perceiving the program. Um, I don't know, uh, Crystal's been talking with parents, maybe she has a better understanding of, uh, of that. But um, I think the simplicity of the tagline uh, betrays the complexity of how this is actually being rolled out. Okay, thank you. I, I totally agree. Um, I mean, a $10 a day child care program is in my... Pro my opinion, a campaign promise with no no real substance behind it. Um, I think that, you know, our association, both provincially and nationally, is really taking on like a parent awareness uh, perspective here because um, it's important, like you, your children are, are your most important part of your life and you need to understand what this is going to do to child care and what it's going to do to the care that they're receiving and, and your options and choice. Um, we are launching a week-long awareness campaign starting October 21st um, across Canada in the hopes of, of bringing some kind of light to, to all of the issues and the consequences of this program and the perspective of operators because, um, you know, we're the front line of this program and, and we're really not been engaged at all as, as parents haven't been in creating this program. Um, I think that it's also really important, I like to point out to people that whether you have children or not, you're paying for this program. So like any of these national programs, these national campaigns um, that are coming out of our federal government lately, where does the money come for this? Like we're $30 billion invested in this and we're providing access to one in three families. Like that is not a successful investment in my opinion. Where does the rest of the money come to, to get all of the families included in this program. And especially if we're running it as totally a, a public service in a for a nonprofit sector, um, who's funding all of that? Because on my understanding of reading like the Fraser Institute report, uh, we're paying 43% of our income to taxes already. So um, I think there should be some concern around this. And I, I want to say too, like with the wages for staffing and ECEs, we absolutely need to be paying our ECs better. And uh, there's been wage grids and different reports put forward, which all, again, sound wonderful and are totally justified for these educators. But where does the money come for those wages? Because we're, we have our fees are frozen as operators. 
Our fees are frozen. We cannot increase fees. How are we paying anybody else more? Um, so I think there's a real shortfall of information on what this program actually costs and where where the money is going to come from to to actually make it a reality for most of our families. Yeah, all all families pay for this system. A third perhaps get to use it. That sounds unjust to me. Yeah. Me too. So the 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 choice if the existing model is to be maintained would be something like a uh, massive infusion of additional cash paid for through higher taxes or um, lifting the cap on fees and effectively doing away with the um, with the ten dollar component um, or or the squeeze continues uh, and you have less access uh, not more access I mean, we are asking like nationally with our, our campaign, our national campaign, we're asking for envelope funding. So we've been told by the federal government repeatedly, there's no more money for this program. So we're not asking for that because we already know the answer to that one, but we want to see the money go back to the provinces, uh, cut the federal strings to this um, and allow the provinces to really create programs that represent the families that they serve in those provinces and create a childcare system that works for the provinces, not for the federal ideology of this program. Um, and I, I think, you know, we need to give this back to parents. I'd love to see the money go in some form, whether it's like a directed subsidy or a voucher system or, or anything like that, that it protects parental choice and really takes away, whether it being a nonprofit or a for-profit center, because parents don't pick childcare based on the business model of that center. That's not the deciding factor for most families. Um, so that, those are kind of things. I, I mean, I'm hoping that we, I'll say it, I hope for some change federally in the next, you know, coming future, and maybe this won't be such an issue, but um, I do think we need to look at, at how we're going to move forward in a, a way that actually supports families. Yeah. Crystal, thank you for, for your perspective. You basically answered the last question I was going to ask, which is what what change would you make at a, at a fundamental level to the program? So Peter, I'll throw the same question to you that, that Crystal already answered, which is what, um, what, what, what should our child care system look like in Canada? Uh, so my first preference would be to let the current agreements expire. Uh, my second choice would be if that weren't possible to open up the flexibility within those agreements to allow provinces to direct funds to where they see fit. And I would be quite happy to see that directed to families. Um, to use that for the type of care that they like. Um, I'm comfortable with that being care either in the license system or outside the license system. Um, I think also uh, there are current federal uh, policies um, and programs that could be better, um, I think could be put to better, or I guess um, reimagined or improved upon. So there is a, a child uh, care tax uh, deduction. I think um, there's ways to actually improve that that could be better leveraged towards low income families. Um, uh, I see uh, often the Canada Child Benefit is not seen as a child care per se uh, kind of program, but I do actually see that that's an existing tool that could be leveraged to put cash in the hands of, of families. And I think if you took that $30 billion and you spread it out among all families in Canada, that would be a substantial amount of, uh, of change if people are, if, uh, if uh, policymakers are so inclined to, to that kind of model. Um, I think there's lots of options and lots of ways to better support families. Um, than, than, the current, uh, than the current model, but I would be certainly for uh, more direct payment to parent. Um, right, and just to note from, from both of your comments, I mean, there's a spectrum within that. One is, is a, a model like the, uh, the universal childcare benefit uh, uh, that uh, conservatives brought in uh, initially that, that paid direct subsidies to, to parents financially. Uh, you could envision, you mentioned, Crystal, a, a, a voucher type system where, um, you know, you, Maybe it maybe the, the 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 size of that voucher varies depending on on means, and uh, there are parameters around where that voucher can be can be cashed. Not not to endorse one system or another, but just to say there's there's a spectrum of of options that still um, that still put the childcare user in more control as opposed to uh, kind of a more more top down construction. Exactly. Yeah. 
and some of those models were pre-existing in provinces. Yeah. So Manitoba looks very much different than than Alberta, right? And then yeah. the federal program sort of um, it's kind of pressing one way of doing things into a, just a diverse uh, way of, of providing childcare across the country. Yeah. Well, thank you both for a, a really rich uh, conversation. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to get back to my own personal childcare responsibilities <laughs> now, and I'm, I'm glad we didn't have any uh, interruptions working from my home office here. Um, it's, uh, it's great to chat with both of you and uh, I hope more people reflect on this issue and, uh, and, and and don't just believe the top line, but actually think about what's really going on and uh, and what the uh, medium and long term impacts of this policy are actually going to be. Uh, so so thank you again, uh, folks. We, we release resuming debate episodes about every two weeks uh, and uh, we we cover a rich uh, a blend of topics. Uh, you can find us on YouTube as well as uh, anywhere you get your, your podcast, various platforms. Please uh, leave a review and we look forward to being back with another episode in 14 days. Mm -hmm.